coming up on Destination Tomorrow, we'll discover that in the near future, pilots will be able to fly through low visibility using a new technology developed at NASA. We'll also learn how lasers allow researchers to measure ozone and pollutants in our atmosphere. And we take a look back at how one man's relentless determination changed NASA's approach to successfully landing a man on the moon and bringing him home safely. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hi, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien, and welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. Our world is shaped by math, science, and technology. They are ever-present in our daily lives. Almost a century ago, two brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, used the knowledge of their time to design and fly a heavier-than-air machine off the dunes near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Today, NASA is using the latest research to advance the science of flight, so flying will be safer. Let's go behind the scenes to see how NASA is changing the way that future pilots will navigate through low visibility conditions. Erica Johnson shows us how this developing technology called synthetic vision will help save lives. Limited visibility is the greatest contributing factor in most fatal worldwide airline and general aviation crashes. In commercial aviation, over 30% of all fatal accidents worldwide are categorized as controlled flight into terrain accidents. This is when a functioning aircraft crashes into terrain or other obstacles the pilots could not see due to poor visibility. A revolutionary new cockpit display system currently being developed by NASA will help prevent many of these accidents from ever occurring again. I spoke with researchers in the Aviation Safety Program at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more about how synthetic vision will make flying safer for everyone. Synthetic vision is essentially an electronic window for the pilot. When he looks at his real window and he sees nothing but clouds or perhaps he's flying at night, by looking down at his synthetic vision display, he'll see the real world. So the computer draws a scene of the world. Uh, it's a bright, sunshiny view of what's outside the cockpit. And the pilot uses that uh, when he can't see out the window. Will synthetic vision save lives? Oh, without a doubt. 30% of, of fatal accidents are accidents when a good functioning airplane runs into terrain because the pilot can't see it, not because there's anything wrong with the airplane. Uh, we also have in the U.S. a problem called runway incursion accidents. That's when a taxiing airplane on the ground and an airplane that's uh, trying to land have a runway conflict. And this kind of display, because it does show traffic, can eliminate that kind of accident as well. What does the display look like? Actually, Linda's flying the simulator. It's probably easier to show you than to describe it to you. What we have here now are conventional displays that you find in a typical transport aircraft. The top display is called a primary flight display. That gives the pilot the information he needs to fly the plane. If you can imagine when it's, a, when it's a nice day outside, like it is now, if you look out outside, nice, bright, sunshiny day, you can see the mountains, you can see the airport environment. It's really not a problem using this type of instrumentation. The pilot has a good feel of where he is with regard to the terrain and, and other traffic. But imagine, if you will, if, if it was nighttime or if it was foggy outside, like we can see now in the simulator. Now the only information the pilot has to fly by is what he sees on his instruments. But after you've flown in the fog for a while or the nighttime conditions, you might lose your situational awareness or where you are with respect to um, other terrain, the path that, that you're supposed to be flying to the airport, um, and other traffic. So what we thought we would do, and what Russ talked about earlier, is bring synthetic vision into the cockpit. So we were bringing this synthetic vision display and replace the head down primary flight display with a synthetic vision display. And that's what you're seeing now. So in this display, and if you want to look outside the window, you can kind of see how that same mountain, mountainous information is also represented head down in the primary flight display. In addition to showing the terrain features and other information like that, also in the um, primary flight display, you can show your speed and altitude information to fly the aircraft. So now, with the synthetic vision display, the pilot has a good feel of where he is with regard to the terrain and other traffic. And again, if we were to have uh, fog outside or nighttime condition, as you can see here, the transitions from the out the window to head down to the synthetic vision display, you can very easily see where he is with respect to the runway environment and other traffic. What kind of research goes into synthetic vision? 
once we have um, done our simulation experiments in simulators, then we go validate the display concepts in flight. One aircraft we used was unique in that it had two cockpits. The, uh, the aircraft, the way it was shaped, you had a, the, a normal aircraft and then it added an extra nose or extra cockpit on the front of the aircraft. The research displays are in that front nose of the cockpit as well as the, uh, the um, research pilot and the um, principal investigator. And then in the, the second cockpit, which is behind this uh, research cockpit, two safety pilots fly. We really think that synthetic vision can save lives. In fact, the goal we're trying to meet is to reduce the fatal aircraft accident rate by 80% in 10 years, 90% in 20 years. We're just so excited about this technology because you really can provide the pilot information that we think is going to be able to save lives. NASA researchers believe that synthetic vision could be retrofitted onto commercial airliners within the next five years. Coming up, discover how a NASA technology is helping expectant mothers to monitor their pregnancy at home. But first, did you know that the distance flown by the Wright brothers in their first flight was shorter than the wingspan of a Boeing 747? The Wright's first flight was 120 feet, while the wingspan of a 747 is 195 feet, 8 inches. According to doctors, 10% of all pregnancies can be categorized as high risk. That is when a woman or an unborn child has a greater chance of a complication or infection. Now, an exciting new technology developed at NASA gives new hope to expectant mothers. Our own Paula Vaden explains. Imagine you're an expectant mother who happens to live in a remote area that suffers from a lack of appropriate health care. So routine doctor's visits for prenatal checkups are, unfortunately, not a part of your schedule. Well, NASA is changing the way pregnant women can receive medical attention right in their own homes. And NASA technology, originally used to measure airflow over airplane wings, has been successfully used to develop a portable, non-invasive, easy to use fetal heart rate monitor. This technology can listen, document and store fetal heart rate data without injecting energy into the womb. In fact, in its present form, an at-home patient can send heart rate information directly to her doctor's office via the internet. I spoke with Dr. Alan Zuckawar of NASA Langley's Advanced Measurement and Diagnostics Branch and found that this technology may soon find its way into your home. The portable fetal heart monitor developed by NASA permits an expected mother to perform fetal testing at home. Uh, about 10% of uh, pregnancies in this country are put into the high risk category for one reason or another. And normally, uh, the way things are today, mom goes into the clinic once or twice a week to do testing. Uh, it's done by ultrasound which is a technology that is not very well suited for an inexperienced mother to use at home. Mm -hmm. Our device is a passive device. It's just like a stethoscope. And it's, in fact, we describe it as an electronic stethoscope, which is very safe. And mom can perform the same testing daily in the comfort of her own home. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, doctors use ultrasound to, to measure the fetal heart rate. Why is this portable fetal heart rate monitor such an important medical device? Well, the ultrasound uh, injects uh, an ultrasonic signal and measures the Doppler shift by the uh, flapping of the fetal heart valve. Uh, our device is entirely passive. That is, the fetal tone appearing on the maternal abdominal surface is picked up by one of seven sensors and the array is strapped to the maternal abdomen. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be tight, just so we have good contact. The reason we have several sensors is that the fetal tone is actually highly localized. When the fetal heart tone impinges on the sensor, it generates an electrical impulse, which goes through our interface box, is filtered, and then goes to our computer for signal processing. And sounds something like that. And sounds here. like that. And the computer software has to be able to pick out the fetal tone from amongst all the background noise. So that is essentially what the fetal passive technology does. I know you're not a, an obstetrician, but can you tell me how the device helps babies? Right. Well, the device does permit uh, increased frequency of surveillance of the expectant mom. And uh, this is uh, for the high-risk patients this is a key issue. Uh, this can be explained more 
fully by my colleague David Shannon. The fetal heart monitor's beauty comes from three points. One, it's passive. Two, it's non-invasive. And three, it's portable. Uh, it's passive, meaning that there's no energy going into the womb. It's like a big microphone or uh, ear listening to the pulse coming from the fetus, okay? Secondly, being non-invasive, it's warm on the exterior of the abdomen, so there's no breaking the skin. And lastly, it's portable. So in a situation where you have a high-risk pregnancy and mom needs to be monitored maybe three or four times a week, the baby is subjected to energy every time you use the current state of the art. However, with this, the mom can wear it essentially every day, all day. There's no energy going into the womb. Therefore, the baby is not subjected to that transmitted energy. It's amazing. Yeah. So when I think of NASA, traditionally, I think of, of the space programs and the wonderful breakthroughs there. How did they become involved in such an exciting medical breakthrough? Well, we had a problem statement to come in from a doctor who was working with patients who lived in a remote area, and he was having difficulty implementing a remote fetal heart monitoring capability. So he sent a problem statement to headquarters, and headquarters sent it down to Langley, and Dr. Zuckerwar was working with piezoelectric film at the time, characterizing the airflow over an airfoil in the wind tunnel. And he thought that, hey, this would be a great match for this type of problem. One, it's flexible, so it could fit around the abdomen of the mother, and two, it was sensitive so that it could pick up the fetal pulse and then give the information to some software on a computer, and then that could be transmitted to the doctor office and the doctor can monitor the well-being of that child during that time. Oh, it's truly amazing. So when do you all expect that doctors will actually be able to have this device uh, in their offices and available to the patients? Well, the information is being submitted to the FDA for approval at this time. Upon their approval, then it will be made available through our licensed partner. We anticipate within the next two years that it will be on the market if all goes well with the approval from the FDA. Then our licensing partner can take it to market and hopefully we'll be able to save lives. On May 25th, 1961, President Kennedy announced to the world that the United States would make it a national goal to land a man on the moon and then return him home safely before the end of the decade. In fact, I'm standing in front of the former Lunar Landing Research Facility here at NASA Langley, where the Apollo astronauts trained for their moon landings. Once the decision to go to the moon was made, the next question was how to get there. In early 1961, three main approaches emerged, direct ascent, Earth orbit rendezvous, and lunar orbit rendezvous. John Hobolt, a theoretical mathematician at the NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, championed the approach that came to be called lunar orbit rendezvous, or LOR. LOR required the use of two vehicles, the lunar excursion module, or LEM, to land on the moon, and the command module, which remained in lunar orbit. When the landing mission was over, the LEM would return to lunar orbit and rendezvous with the command module for the return trip to Earth. The LOR approach received a cold reception in the early meetings within NASA. Many thought that LOR was the most dangerous of the three approaches. And this is an indication of the feeling that most people had about it. He says, Hobel has a scheme of 50% chance of getting a man to the moon and a 1% chance of getting him back. That was the general feeling at the time. And that's the obstacle I had to overcome. Many in NASA assumed that direct ascent was the simplest approach to get to the moon. Direct ascent would use a single, large spacecraft that would be launched from Earth, land on the moon, and return to Earth. This approach was scrapped once NASA engineers realized that the rocket would be too large, difficult, and expensive to build. The approach receiving the most support, including the famed rocket scientist Werner von Braun, was Earth Orbit Rendezvous, or EOR. EOR involved launching pieces of the spacecraft on a series of boosters and then assembling them in Earth orbit. This approach was soon discounted when it became obvious that it would be very difficult and would take too long to develop. John Hobolt at NASA Langley continued to push the LOR idea to anyone who would listen. In a sense, it tended to be discouraging to me, but at the same time,